there are um, different types of sermons. There are some sermons that are meant to teach, some meant to inspire, some meant to challenge. Um, the sermon that I'm doing this morning, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping, uh, touches each of you in your heart uh, and also inspires you to uh, an, an ever greater and deepening uh, relationship with God through prayer. I put it in the uh, news bites this week, but I was going to be talking about prayer uh, this morning. Um, it's something, like, I, I don't usually use uh, a set of sermon time for specific uh, in, instructional type things. To me, that's what study groups are for. Uh, but I'd like to do that today because of a couple of things that have happened recently. Um, some personal and some in relation to people that I've had conversations with regarding prayer. Uh, the first thing that I, that I want to say is uh, most of us, or maybe a lot of us, maybe not most, maybe a lot, uh, we're brought up with a particular understanding of how prayer is supposed to be done. And I don't know where this supposed to thing comes from, uh, but there's a lot of supposed to's in life. When you look at them, uh, they're really not supposed to's, they're more like uh, maybe if it works is. Um, I grew up in a tradition, uh, the Anglo-Catholic tradition, I think a lot of you know that, um, and there was very much of an emphasis, and not inappropriately, but very much of an em emphasis on the structure of worship. Uh, the church that I grew up in did liturgy extremely well and effectively, uh, and I learned from liturgy from some, from some very, very uh, able, skilled, and dedicated uh, people. Um, but what, what, what I never realized was that what I grew up with and what I learned was only one method or style uh, amongst many. It was significantly later in life, uh, and after facing some you know, particular issues regarding my own spirituality that I realized that what I grew up with uh, as it relates to prayer and worship wasn't necessarily suited to my temperament and personality. Uh, to illustrate this, for example, when I was ordained, one of the promises that I made was that I would daily do the offices of the church, which is morning prayer and evening prayer. And so every morning I was supposed to get with my prayer book and open it up and go through the form of the morning prayer service and end every evening the form of the evening prayer service. Well, frankly, that just that just doesn't suit my personality. Uh, that's not the way I, I live my life. That's not the way I express myself in that sort of structured way. That's not to say that it has no validity or is it good for some people, but it's just not the way I'm, I'm hardwired. And it was years later when uh, and some of you will remember when Sister Emily Louise Scott came here for a uh, mission on prayer a lot of years ago. And she was talking about what types of prayer suited what personality types. And I learned that that sort of formal structure of prayer really only fits the personality of about 4% of the population. Um, that most of us tend to pray in a different way, if we pray at all. The sad thing is, sometimes think that people think that if they're not doing it a certain way, uh, that it's not, well, they, it, it, they shouldn't, there's no point doing it. Uh, or equally, if they try to adopt a certain way, a way that isn't suited towards them, and it doesn't feel right, it doesn't sit right, it isn't effective, uh, there's just the whole notion of prayer. Uh, and so the first thing that I would want to say as a point in this sermon is, it is crucial to understand that there are different types of praying and different ways of praying, uh, and there is one for each of our personalities uh, that would be an effective way of communicating with God and building a relationship with Him. Um, I discovered what suits me quite by accident. Uh, I later learned it was uh, called, it's, it's a Franciscan model. Um, the Franciscans have a, a belief, prayer is work and work is prayer. Uh, he who works prays twice is a phrase that you may, may have heard. And so if you were to visit a Franciscan monastery, uh, you might find some of the brothers out in the fields uh, tending the crops. And they would see that as an act of work, but they would also see it as an act of worship. That as they are doing that, they are connecting with God and his creation, and also it becomes a spring work for prayer for people, for food, for the hungry. And it becomes a trigger for ministry as we use that context to respond to people's real needs. Uh, if you were to go into the kitchen, uh, you would see monks baking bread. Uh, and the parallels there are, are, are obvious, but similarly, 
they're preparing food for their family table, the monastery table, uh, their community, and obviously that, that, that leads to prayer. Uh, and so on it goes. Of course, we would also go to chapel with them, and they would sing, they would pray, and there would be the formal structures as well. But I learned that what comes naturally to me could appropriately be called a Franciscan model of prayer. Uh, I've said this before, and I hope, I hope, I hope it's not tedious, um, but a lot of years ago when we were turning around the church, uh, I made that uh, the, the, the altar that we have up there. And it's not fancy, it's never going to win any design prizes or anything like that, but it is useful and effective. Uh, this was at a time in my life where I was willing and able to do a whole lot of carpentry type stuff. And as I was cutting the wood, as I was you know, gluing it together, and screwing it together, and putting it together, and sanding it, and finishing it, uh, I would be praying for all the people, known and at that time unknown, who would be receiving communion at that altar. And I'd be praying that that altar would be a place of spiritual sustenance for people in difficult times in life, that it would be a place of spiritual growth, that it would be a place of healing, that it would be a place of revelation, uh, that through the services we do in this church and through communions we celebrate, uh, at that time using that altar, uh, people would come to know God in a new and deeper way. And so as I was using my hands, it was an actual trigger to my personality uh, to, to go into worship that way. Uh, and so that's, that's, the type of, that's the type of prayer that I've adopted. Um, so uh, you can go and tell the bishop that I broke the rules, and I don't sit down with my prayer book every morning, and I don't sit down with my prayer book every evening. You do that if you want. But while you're doing that, you can tell him that well, the Lord does pray, and prays rather frequently, uh, but just in the style that he has adopted as his own. Certainly not invented, but adopted as my own because it suits my personality. What I want you to know is there's a type of prayer that suits your personality in which, through which, you can connect with God. I want to unfold that a little bit from personal experience uh, and then generalize it using uh, a little bit using today's gospel and last week's gospel that we used. I want to tell you something that happened recently and in fact inspired this sermon. I was having a conversation with someone and I was explaining, um, uh, without going overboard, a spiritual difficulty I, I was going through. And uh, not a major crisis or anything like that, but just something I was having a hard time with. Um, when I was diagnosed with MS, um, it, is, it is shattering in a lot of ways. Uh, and the future becomes very much unknown. And uh, maybe others are you know, more equipped than I. Uh, but the spirituality that I had at that particular time um, didn't have contained within it uh, what I needed to get me through that time. Uh, now, don't hear anything I'm not saying. It wasn't a crisis of faith because um, my God isn't a magician who just sort of, you know, hands out, you know, benevolent magic just because he wants it. Uh, and, and, and I never lost faith or anything like that because of this. But it was the spirituality that I had was basically a spirituality <coughs> born of strength. You know, somewhere in my desk, there's a picture of me with a 125-pound uh, jackhammer over my shoulder from when we cracked through the slabs to put the new pipes here. And that's what I grew up with. Like, I grew up strong. And uh, even now, there's parts of my body that are still quite strong. And uh, it would be quite appropriate to say I relied on my own human strength more than I ought to have, uh, unless on God's strength. Uh, but every now and then, life, you know, gets in the head or whatever, and, and you, you come face to face with that. And MS is one of the things that challenged my spirituality, uh, my personal faith, uh, my personal spirituality uh, needed to change. And one of the things that happened, um, it, 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 it would conform with my Franciscan model of, of prayer. As the disabilities became more evident, um, they became for me, triggers for prayer. Uh, the first sign that something was wrong, this is before I'm being diagnosed with MS, was my right hand going up. And that took away guitar playing from me. It was a loss. Um, and I'm, like a lot of people, not that great at grieving. It's hard to enter into loss. We try to deny loss, we try to push it away. Uh, we don't like feeling the feelings associated with loss. But you've got to grieve. And even if the loss isn't a person, which of course is you know, running my hand, but to, to lose the ability to play guitar. Uh, that was a loss that needed to be grieved. And how do you grieve a loss of mobility? Uh, and how do you, how do you, how
how do you how do you express spirituality when that's the nature of the loss? Well, that's not what I started doing was as I faced the reality of what was going on with, with my hand, and later with more of my body, um, and I'm not trying to be silly at all here. And maybe I don't know how to word this in a way that doesn't sound at least a little bit silly, but I, I don't mean to sound silly. I began to pray using the deficient body parts as a trigger. Um, for example, you know, as, as, as my hands get stiffer and number, um, I think people who either through accident or illness or circumstance don't have the privilege and the joy of using their hands uh, in, in life and uh, for work and, and for play. And um, one of the things that uh, I'll, I'll just share with you, you might recall a number of years ago, we watched a video called Chicken Alec Park. And what this was, it was <coughs> in the Philippines, and uh, it's about poverty. And uh, it starts off with two rather wealthy looking young girls going into a fast food place uh, somewhere in the Philippines, I think it's Manila. Uh, and they order a meal, and it's brought to them. And it's, it's chicken, you know, chicken and french fries and other stuff and drinks. And one of the girls gets to call on her cell phone. And talking to the person, they decide that they're going to leave the restaurant and obviously eat up. And so they leave basically pretty much untouched meals. They, they nibble the pretty much untouched me meals on their plate. And what happens next is the waiter comes, picks up the plates and takes them to the garbage and throws them in the garbage. And then the next scene is this man driving up on his bicycle, a tricycle action, and, um, and he's got a garbage can tied to it. And he looks through the garbage of this fast food restaurant. And takes out this leftover, uh, which he carefully wraps and brings home and sits down with his family for what for them was a feast. And one of his kids reaches to, to, to grab, and I can't remember whether the father actually, you know, taps his hand or just goes like this, but no, we're going to say thanks to God for the food, then we're going to say grace before you eat. And it's just such an irony how much we complain about and here's a man who, through no fault of his own, through the circumstances into which he was born, cannot use his hands to make a living to support his family. So for me, that became a trick for prayer. Um, as the disabilities progressed, uh, and my legs have gotten, you know, weirder, um, the, the, the parallel, I'm sure for you now, can be can be obvious. Uh, people who don't have the function of their bodies, people who are sitting by themselves alone because they can't get around, people who don't have the friends to support them, uh, people who who suffer because of the loss of the use of their legs and mobility, people who have lost their employment, uh, people who have a personal crisis of identity because they can no longer do uh, what they used to do. Imagine being a construction worker uh, who you loses the use of your legs and you can no longer do what you're trained for or what you're like doing. Uh, so that obviously becomes a trigger for prayer for people who are ill uh, or affected in, in that way. It also becomes an opportunity for prayers of thanksgiving because my, I'll call it a job, it's not a job, but what I do uh, professionally is not really all that related to use my hands. Um, you can do a communion service with numb fingers that don't bend properly. Um, thanks to people like um, Jane Parsons and uh, Alan Cook and Ardeth and uh, <coughs> Bethany and, and Murr uh, and, and, and some of you um, with the aid of a scooter or a walker or whatever, uh, most of my things of my vocation, I can still do. Uh, it can be awkward, it can be kind of miserable, but I can still do them. Uh, so prayer, which can start as a lament, can also become a prayer of thanksgiving. And so one of the things, point number two, that I'd like to suggest to you, as you bring before God the disabilities in your life, and not be afraid of them, uh, that will be the scriptural stuff a little while later, what you will find and it might be sometimes in spite of yourself, you might 
find yourself evolving into prayers of thanksgiving for what you do have and for what contributes in your life to, can I just use a shorthand term, health. Um, it is not exclusively because of, but it certainly is partially because of my disability that more often I'm going to be at the CLSC uh, doing a talk on spirituality and mental health to people who have had, who have had some difficulties in their life. Uh, so there again, a difficulty, and I do not want to whitewash any of it. Um, that would insult you, and it would just be passive. A difficulty can, without denial, turn into an opportunity to find some praise. But every now and then, something comes along with rocks and, and hits you upside the head and it sort of pushes the scramble button and whatever other images you want to use. And I had one of those recently. That's what led to the conversation that I referred to earlier. Um, without going into the trip to Disney again, you know, I said I wasn't going to do Disney sermons all the time. Um, there were some circumstances that, 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 that were particularly difficult for me. Uh, as you will know, and reasonably so, over the past three or four years particularly, uh, I've made adaptation in my life and my environment to deal with what's going on with my body. Uh, <coughs> my scooter was a wonderful thing. Gene Foreman uh, got me my first walker. That was a wonderful thing. It practically eliminated falls, you know. I was falling so much because I really couldn't walk with a stick anymore. But I had not progressed to the point where I accepted it was time for a walker. So she got me one. That was wonderful. And so I've adapted. I've adapted with my hardware and I've also adapted with the way I do what I do. But every now and then something happens and you're just not adapted. And one of the things for me was getting on and off the airplanes on a trip to Disney. And the people were lovely. I think I said last week, uh, I'd love to take them all out for a beer because they're so great. Uh, but at the same time, I was pushed from one place to another in a wheelchair, except that. But then getting onto the plane, they put me in this thing called a Washington chair, which was very narrow. And they strap my legs together so that they go down the aisle and they strap me in and my arms are together and all like this. And I felt like a trust turkey before Thanksgiving. And it wasn't a good feeling. Uh, I felt humiliated. You know, humiliation is a feeling. Uh, and feelings are were neither right nor wrong. They are what they are. And I'm not saying that anybody was trying to humiliate me. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. But that's how I felt. I never felt more disabled and handicapped in my life, and it hurt. And one thing happened, and it's happened to me once in my life before, and uh, one thing happened that I recognized, but did not welcome as a friend at that particular time. I could not use that experience as a trigger for prayer. I just could not at that point. Uh, it was too hard and too close to the core. And I was sharing this with, uh, I've shared it with a couple of people, but one in particular said, well, what did you do? You know. Uh, well, what I did was I talked to God about that, you know, that I was finding it very difficult to see any spiritual upside to this. Oh, maybe someday it's going to make me a holy person to feel humiliated, but I'm sure today. And it was very hard. It was really, really hard. And it's hard in English language and English words to communicate the feelings behind what I'm saying here. Um, and it's not that I felt that God had abandoned me. It's not that I felt punished or, or victimized or anything like that. It was just one of those experiences that can happen to you that's really, really hard and that rocks you. Um, <coughs> but, and I don't want this to sound like it's always Pollyanna happily ever after. Um, but what has happened since then, and it's not like a flashing light or anything like that, but it's been a gradual thing. Thinking of all the people, well, I can't think of all the people, but thinking of people through whom, for whom their life circumstances, through no fault of their own, or maybe sometimes through the fault of their own, have left them with a the feeling of being out of control, that they are not in control of their life. Now, any of us who feel that we're in control of our lives, you're illusional and delusional, because we're not. Anything can happen at any given time. We like to protect ourselves with the feeling that we are in charge and we are 
in control. But we're not. We're not in control. We're not in control of our job. We're not in control of our health. We're not in control of most of the relationships we have with people. Um, we are participants, but we are not in control. And any sense of control is illusory at best. That's not to say we should all go whatever. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> control is an illusion. And that's what, I was, that's what I was facing. I was facing the fact that here I was in a chair, like a trust turkey, and other people were lifting my chair and pulling me around and pushing me around with the most wonderful of intentions. But there was nothing I could do about it. I was not in control. And that was hard. That was really hard. But then, the evolution is. And when you take things to God, the evolution will be. It becomes spiritual. Our God is a redemptive God. He doesn't deny the reality of human suffering. He doesn't deny the reality of human pain. He doesn't deny the reality of the human condition. He enters into it. If there's a message of Good Friday to Easter, what other message is there? God enters into the reality of the human condition. And God enters into my reality again and again. God enters into your realities again and again. And so here, I start thinking of, I said before, all the people. Um, I can't think of all the people, but people who are not in control of their lives. You start thinking of the homeless. You know, when I worked um, one summer at St. Michael's Mission, most of the people who were at St. Michael's Mission um, were what we would call wives or alcoholics, for short of term, maybe. <coughs> That's what they would be called. You know? uh, now, maybe not majority clientele, but a large number of the people who use St. Michael's Mission to great effect uh, are people who are ex uh, discharged psychiatric patients, uh, who are pretty much on their own. Uh, because we want to process people through the system, because it makes the statistics look better, how many people are being treated. And sometimes what happens is people take themselves off their medication and feel they don't need it anymore. And the more the medication goes out of their system, the less they feel they need it. They get worse and worse, but they feel better and better, or at least they feel they're feeling better and better. And bad things can happen. And we also, even on the West Island now, every now and then see somebody standing on a street corner who knows what their story is, saying, hungry, out of work, and they're you know, when you stop at the light, they're asking you for money. I don't know what their story is. Maybe they're, maybe they're just lazy, you know, maybe, who knows what. But to be doing that under any circumstance is <coughs> something very profound and very serious about human brokenness and human need. And CBC Radio, you know, I'm not always the greatest fan of the political stance of CBC Radio. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting articles and stuff. And uh, I heard, as you have heard, about that situation in Nigeria, where all these young girls were kidnapped, um, and uh, they're going to be sold if they have already been into slavery. Uh, talk about feeling out of control, and like you have no sense of control over your life and your environment. And the people who are doing it, uh, seem quite able and pleased to say uh, that they will be sold into slavery and sex slavery um, and as little as $12. There's the price of it for you, $12. And what's even, well, what's even worse, what a silly thing to say, that there are men who are willing to pay $12 to buy that slave. We're in a broken world. What I'd like to suggest is when we engage into our own brokenness, as opposed to running from it and hiding from it, what we will find is we begin to identify with the sufferings of Christ and the cross of Christ and the redemptive work of Christ. We enter in a new way into this redemptive plan. Does all pain and suffering go away? Absolutely not. That is not the case. Though God is the God who heals, and you never know. But entering into our suffering and our bad experiences isn't giving in to the end, isn't giving into despair. What it is, is entering into reality. And as we allow God to enter into our reality, we find redemption at work. Just a couple of uh, biblical references from recent Gospels just, just make sense in this context to look at. 
Remember the gospel last week was the story of the road to Emmaus, where there were followers of Jesus. They weren't part of the, uh, the core. Uh, they weren't the disciples. The followers of Jesus who had been in Jerusalem, clearly with him. Uh, and uh, they're walking along the road, and they're very downcast. They're depressed. They're upset because of the circumstances that they're experiencing. The circumstances that they had thought Jesus was the one. He was the one who was going to pick up the Romans and establish the nation of Israel, restore the, 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 the throne of David, and all that sort of stuff. And everything was going to be the promised land all over again. They put their hope, they put their life, they put their future. They had paved that road and were ready to ride down. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is dead. And not only is the road not there anymore, it's like, and not paved anymore, it's just, it's just not there. It's, it's cut off. They're devastated. They're talking about this. Jesus catches up to them, for some reason, who knows why, uh, his identity wasn't manifest. And he says, what are you talking about? Uh, you look all upset. Uh, and they say to him, like, are you the only one in Jerusalem who's been visiting Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened? Uh, there was this man, he was an incredible prophet, and we thought that he was the hope of Israel. And uh, he was going to set us free. It's like the next was on. And, uh, but now he's dead, but they killed him. And, you know, hope is dashed. And Jesus is listening, he does. And then he says stuff to him. He says, well, you know, don't you know that we're like, there's another side to this? And don't you know that all these things have to happen? Uh, this is the way it's supposed to happen. It may not look like it, but this is the way it's supposed to happen. And Jesus tells them all the spiritual references that show that the Messiah, the one who brings in the kingdom of God, is not going to be a king of power, and physical strength and violence and aggression. No. Uh, it's going to be something very, very different. He opens their mind and their heart to understand the nature of the working of God and His redemptive plan. And it's not going to be a whitewash job. It's going to be very, very different. And by then it's getting late. And so they say to him, to a stranger, uh, come stay with us for the night. Because it was the practice that uh, because of the danger of robbers and all the rest of it, if you were walking with a stranger, you walk in hospitality and safety of your home for the night. And then equally as was custom, uh, when Jesus sat down, they asked the invited guests to say grace, much like when the minister comes to house to your house for supper, you say, Lord, would you like to say grace? And I say, uh, no, it's your house, you do it. And then I find out when was the last time I said grace. Anyway, uh, so they invite Jesus to say the blessing. And so he takes the bread, uh, which was the custom, it's the way he blessed the meal and he breaks it. Uh, he says, blessed are in Hebrew, God with the high faith of God. Um, blessed be the Lord God, the universe was brought forth through the earth. And then he would inevitably bless the wine as well. I think as an angel, that's a great idea to talk. Bless the wine before you drink. Blessed are you, Lord God, the universe was brought forth through the vine. And in the blessing, which is an act of worship and prayer, their eyes are opened to the reality of Jesus. They go from being distraught, depressed, devastated to it's him. They encounter him in the real circumstances of their life in prayer. That's important for us to understand. If we try to present a good face, or if we try to pray in a way that we think is the right way to pray, it doesn't really suit our personality and our guts. It, 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 it will feel some bad. But if we identify a way of praying that is that just makes sense for who we are as an individual. And if we do that, what will happen is we will encounter Jesus in that time. We will experience redemption in that time. And shortly after redemption comes transformation. And just a quick reference, because time is short, to the, the gospel for today. It's the story of the Good Shepherd. He's leading the sheep. Well, he's leading from behind, actually, which is another sermon in and of itself. And so the sheep recognizes his voice. The sheep recognizes his voice. As we come to God in a way that is authentic to us, as we pray, as we bring everything to him, the good stuff and the bad stuff, the stuff that we got figured out, and I'm going to put this in, though it may not be right, but especially, especially, the things we haven't got an answer for or haven't got figured out, I believe that what we will do is we will hear the shepherd's voice. Jesus will be there. He'll be tapping us on the shoulder. He'll be whispering in our ear. He'll be touching our heart. He'll be relaxing our body. 
but in some way he would be there doing his redemptive act. And Jesus, redemptive act, is always a way of healing. Let's get that closer to the mic. Jesus' redemptive act is always a way of, uh, is always a method of healing. That's the result. Healing of our minds, healing of our memories, healing of our emotions, sometimes even healing of our bodies. So the next time something happens to you or you're just going through something that you, perhaps isn't, isn't optimal and perhaps you wouldn't choose for yourself and none of your friends would choose for you, understand that if you come to God honestly and openly in a way that is authentic to you, not what somebody else says your prayer should be like, you will encounter Jesus in the metaphorical breaking of the bread. That will be redemptive and that will be transformative. It will change your life in the life of everybody you come in contact with. So, a little bit of a prayer for today. And now, quite appropriately, let's pray. Amen. <coughs> Lord, I suspect that there are lots of times in our lives where you are there um, in a situation that is not pleasant, not good, not happy, not optimal, wanting to be involved in it. And sometimes because we have preconceived notions of how holy we have to be, or how good we have to be, or how particular we have to be, we keep you at a distance. Maybe on purpose, maybe quite by accident. As human beings, we all have a problem with openness and vulnerability. Uh, we learned from a pretty young age that when you make yourself vulnerable, sometimes you get kicked. And so we learn to build up walls. Lord, help us to take down those walls, at least with you, so that we can know and experience your strength and your love and your caring for us. Thank you for the people who support us in difficult times, even when sometimes we don't recognize the support as it comes to us or appreciate it. Give us your eyes to see and your heart to feel. And God, I'd also pray that in each one of us that you would just plant a little something uh, that would cause us to want to pray more and to be in relationship with you on a deeper level. And now we bring before you our concerns, our fears, our anger, and our hope as well. For ourselves and for your creation, and particularly for those who we know and love who are going through a difficult time. Lord, use us, uh, damaged and broken as we may be, to share your redemptive message and love with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.